but the extent to which being part of the EU um, is a good idea. Um, we'll focus it on, you know, we'll focus it on those key areas. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, so essentially, on the one hand, we've got the single market and you know, the four freedoms. On the other hand, well, I'm going to run out of hands here. Um, on the other hand, yeah, we're going to have um, the EU's budget. And then on the other, other hand, we've got this kind of joining process, joining criteria. So if we take, if we take the four freedoms, yeah, and, um, then if we take one and two together, free movement um, of goods and services, really this is saying there is you know, total and utter free trade. So wh why might this be, why might this be, or to what extent might this be beneficial? If you look at the kind of reasons this is going to be good, well, firstly, it means obviously, yeah, we know that free trade um, encourages um, you know, kind of comparative advantage. Yeah? Um, just theoretically speaking, the greater, the freer trade is, the greater the extent to which countries can specialise um, in those areas in which they have comparative advantage. That leads, you know, in principle, to a greater, that should lead to um, efficiency and growth. Um, looking at it separately from, you know, kind of narrow theory, it's obviously the case that there's going to be um, an increase in competition. Um, it's much simpler if, you know, to sell goods abroad, so, you know, so why wouldn't you? Um, and we know that competition you know, um, produces benefits you know, um, at a micro level. So increased competition, it should lead to decreased prices for consumers. Um, it should hopefully lead to um, increased choices. Um, competition can also be on quality. So you would expect to see that being part of the EU um, and the competition that that entails would lead to good outcomes for consumers. And also, you know, competition, yeah, I mean, ultimately... Kind of free trade is a product is a product market reform. You know, so at a, at a macro level, you know, kind of it's sort of a supply side policy. You know, you're reforming your product markets to increase the overall level of competition, and by doing that, you know, what that should do um, is it should lead to um, you know, downward pressure on inflation again because there's more competition, um, and firms are forced to be more efficient. So you should get upward pressure on growth, you know, which you can show. Um, yeah, either in you know, some sort of Keynesian model like that, you know, where again you've got your downward pressure on inflation there, and you've got upward pressure on growth there, and that's real GDP. Yeah, um, yeah, so you're kind of moving like that, or you can do it in that kind of more neoclassical framework where you know, kind of your vertical long run aggregate supply is shifting to the right, and again, you've got on the one hand downward pressure on inflation, and on the other hand, you've got um, upward pressure on growth. So um, so it's, you know, um, as I say, so, so at that level, there's, you know, kind of huge levels of, you know, choice is good for consumers and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, obviously you're also now part of a much larger trading area. Yeah. So yeah, it's likely that, um, especially for, yeah, especially for lower income countries, yeah, there's the possibility to, um, increase your exports yeah, and the EU is a huge market or obviously you're having to compete to do that. And one of the most important points is you know, that, um, again, if you think about it from the point of view of a new joiner, one of the most important points is that you get all of the EU's existing trade deals. And the EU is a huge market. Yeah, um, yeah it's a very powerful negotiating body and it has some, yeah, it has some very good trade deals. Yeah, and so if you're a small joiner, yeah, um, yeah, so your Malta, which you know, has, has joined the EU, there's no way Malta would be able to negotiate any sort of decent trade deals itself. But by being part of the EU, it gets all of the trade deals that have been negotiated effectively by France, Germany, Italy, Spain, you know, the big the big EU member states, and that's a, therefore a major major plus you know, for some of these for some of these smaller economies because they get unrestricted access to the EU itself, but also they get whatever whatever access other EU countries have, you know, to markets in, you know, the US, Australia, yeah, and so on and so forth, China. So fine. Um, so what's what's not to like about free movement of goods and services? I mean, obviously, you know, competition has a downside. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the downside of competition um, is obviously that it can lead to job losses um, in those businesses that aren't efficient enough to survive. Now, in theory, that will be mitigated a bit by the Copenhagen criteria on the basis that you're supposed to have a strong functioning market economy before you join. Yeah, but obviously, yeah, there's, an, yeah, there's a limit, there's an extent to which that's never going to be fully true. So competition, you know, you know, the fact that you're having to compete with very efficient German and French companies you know, could easily mean that, you know, that you do suffer, particularly in the short term. 
Secondly, you've got to um, you've got to enact all EU law. Yeah, so there are 35 chapters yeah, of EU law, each which has loads and loads of stuff on labour, yeah, the environment, yeah, and so on and so forth. Um, um, what that's going to do um, is yeah, that's inevitably going to um, increase the costs of local businesses. And therefore it might erode yeah, the you know, competitive advantage that, um, that being part of the you know, sorry, that a new member state might might benefit from having relatively low wages and so on. What it's doing is, you know, by imposing kind of restrictions on environment and labour laws and so on, it's driving up your costs. Now, obviously, there are lots of benefits coming from having labour laws and having um, a clean environment and so on, but you could argue that that is a disadvantage for um, a new member state. And the argument that is also made is that you've got you know, no freedom to negotiate your own free trade deals. And this was an argument that was often made by um, those who supported Brexit. Um, I mean, th that's that's true. Um, but um, but the, you know, the EU has a set of extremely good free trade deals. And if you look at the ones that the UK has managed to negotiate since, um, you know, since we left the EU, then uh, they're nothing, nothing that much to, to write home about. But in principle, it does. It, do, it does restrict you um, in that sense. So economically, yeah, if we take freedoms one and two just initially, yeah, um, what we're saying is that it's going to dramatically increase competition yeah, between between member states. And remember, I'm not talking here yet about the single currency. Yeah, so this is true for Poland, which uses the zloty, not the euro. Yeah, um, yeah. So the EU, by having this you know, single market, you know, there's you know large increase in competition, large increase in the ability to trade, and those things together are generally viewed by economists as a good thing.